What's it like to smoke crack? Imagine the best feeling that you've ever had, multiply that times 10, and then multiply that feeling by another 10. And after my first time, I, I was addicted. It, it stole all my money, um, our family's money, you know, the love of my, my family, my faith, my employment. It, it took everything. It absolutely took everything. I came from a very normal family. I, I came from a family of, of three boys, and we went to school at Salem Lutheran School in Afton. Um, went to Lutheran High School South. Um, you know, I had two older brothers um, that, that introduced me to alcohol. The first time I used marijuana, I was probably around that same age of 13 or 14. When I first started drinking, I, I always ended up drunk. You know, I didn't necessarily set out to get drunk, but I always ended up drunk. I never, I never had a few drinks and stopped. In college is where I really crossed the line in looking back of being what I considered myself, which was a, a um, everyday social drinker to an alcoholic drinker. The, the first time I used crack was at a, a New Year's Eve party in 1991. Um, you know, I had dabbled in drugs a little bit up to that point, but nothing real serious. But we had some cocaine that night and somebody um, made it into the form of crack and, and introduced it to me and, and I tried it. All my other friends did not, but I tried it and, um, and instantly um, fell in love. Kurt and I had dated in high school. Um, he was my first love. And then we ended up going to college. He stayed at the college. I, I left and went, went on another path. But we reconnected um, later in life. Our first date was an Amy Grant concert. It was a Christmas concert. It was just a really, really wonderful time. I had periods of sobriety all throughout my you know, young adult life at that point. But when we got married, she did not know I was drinking or using um, at all. I was under the impression that, um, that he was in recovery. Uh, that was, I didn't know anything about the crack addiction or, um, or any of the other um, problems that, that had been in his life. The first time I found out was actually on our wedding day. Um, I could tell when he was walking up the aisle that he was sweating profusely, and I don't know that he was doing crack that day, um, but he definitely was, had been drinking. At that time, I didn't feel like it was that much of a problem, but yeah, it definitely be, became one. You know, from, from, you know, between 1999, when I got married at, at Webster Gardens Lutheran, through 2012, you know, I was, I was drinking, I was, I was using crack and cocaine, I was active in the church. I was an usher. Uh, my wife and I were active. Our children were baptized there, went to Christ Community Lutheran. We were very active, and at that whole time, I was drinking and I was using drugs. When he was going through all of this, it was really tough. He would stay out and come in early in the morning when he was doing the crack, and that really took a toll um, because I had to keep my job. I mean, we had to have an income, definite income coming in. But there would be periods of, throughout the years, periods of, of sobriety, not long periods of sobriety, you know, and then I would give it another shot where I think I could use or drink again. And, and you know, within a very short period of time, normally six to 12 months, I would lose everything again, or we would lose everything again. When Kurt would do the crack, I didn't realize, I did not have access a lot of times to the bank account and things like that. I didn't know all the passwords. Um, so I had no idea. I knew 
things were coming up missing regarding pawning and things like that. Um, so that kind of thing I knew, but I didn't realize the the amount of money that was being spent. The financial cost of the of the substance abuse was was um was substantial. I mean, it was. You know, it, it's hard to put a, a finger on it, but you, you're probably talking um, 300 to a thousand dollars. You know, maybe a week or or a month. You know, it would it would just depend. I mean, it would depend on a number of factors. But I mean, the cost the cost was was really not financial. The cost was with my family. The cost was with with. Friends, the cost was with the church. The cost, the, the the cost was with my faith. You know, I would always think that the bills were being taken care of, and then come to find out, you know, the truck was gone or what have you. I mean, just different things just started happening, and then obviously it's a slap in the face, and you know that more money's being spent than you have any idea. The pattern was I would I would lose a job. Um, I would go to treatment. I would stay in treatment for, for 30 days. I would come out, I would get a typically a better job than the job I had previously. I would get some success under my belt. And within, you know, between 90 days and 120 days, I would start drinking again. And it always started out with drinking. And ultimately, um, I would drink, you know, maybe normally for one night, maybe normally for a week. But ultimately, I would start drinking alcoholically again, and then, and then, very a very short time, you know, after that, start using drugs. When Kurt would go into treatment, um, there was promises made and things of that nature. And then when he came out, um, a lot of times it it didn't it didn't come to fruition, and then he would slip again. You know, there was days when I woke up that I said, "I'm never going to do that again." You know, I will never do that again. And there was days that I woke up and that I would say, I can't wait to do that again. You know, and I can't tell you the, the differences in those days. I thought, especially at that stage of my life, that, you know, homeless wasn't even a, an option. I mean, I didn't even think that that would ever occur. My wife and my daughter ended up living with, with her mother. My son ended up with a, a friend um, in Webster Groves High School. He's a freshman at Webster Groves High School coming out of CCLS, so he doesn't know a lot of people. And he's having to rely on a friend to live with. And, um, and, I, and I had nowhere to go. And I ended up in, a, in another treatment center. It, it does tear you apart when, when somebody is addicted, um, not only your spouse, but somebody you love. And you want, you want to remove that, but you can't. And then you trust one more time and what have you. And, and just it, it's just, it's very tough. So in 2009, my pastor had come to me and asked me to tell, tell my story. He had, been, he had been with me throughout those many years of, of trying to get sober. And he, had, and he knew that I had a period of sobriety under my belt at this point. And he had asked me to tell my story to the congregation. And, um, and I did. And um, we were starting a, um, a program of, of recovery at the church. And, um, and so I did that. I know it helps some people because I'm still told to this day, people come up to me and thank me for that and that it helped them and it got them, you know, to, to look at their own lives and to look at their own battles that they're fa facing. Shortly thereafter, um, I made a decision to take another drink. What? Um, because I'm an alcoholic, you know, and I thought this time would be different. I thought this time would be different. There was just a lot of anger that, that last time. I think there was a lot of money spent. And I, I think it was just a lot of fear, a lot of, a lot of, um, well, a lot of resentment. I, I was resentful I, that he could do that again. So my, so my using continued um, from, from 2009 until, um, until uh, September of 2012. 
I just got I just got to a point of, of you know what I call pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization you know and I went to the um, I went to, to my basement and I um, I got down on my knees and I asked God to help me I, I really don't know how to describe it you know I, I just know that the way I should have been feeling on that night at 930 that night should have been absolutely um, demoralized but after I after I had that experience in, in my basement um, I felt a glimmer of hope I felt a glimmer of hope and, and by the next morning or shortly thereafter you know within 24 hours I mean I, I, I could see light I could see light you know I, I, I knew there was hope and um, you know um, I don't know how else to describe that. I mean, it was just a magical moment that, that God intervened. I mean, I don't know how else to describe, describe it. Um, when Kirk came to me and told me he had had the revelation and, and with God, I was hopeful. I certainly was. Um, and I thought, you know, let's, let's give this a shot. Let's, let's go for it. But I don't, I don't, I don't fear alcohol, um, and I don't live in fear. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm, at a, I'm at a spot where, where I know I'm in God's hands. I am absolutely in God's hands. And, you know, it was described to me by someone early on in my, in my sobriety, you know, God wouldn't have taken you this far just to drop you on your head. You know, and, and as long as you continue to give back to other people, as long as you continue to give this gift away to others, you will stay sober. And so that's what I do. I do that on a daily basis. Barbecuing for alcoholics or working one-on-one -on -one with another alcoholic to help get, try to get them sober. Or, or going to social events with other alcoholics for, for friendship. That is my life today. My life is taking care of my family, praising God, and, and, t and helping other alcoholics. That is my life. You know, for the, for the person that's still, that, that's out there struggling, I, I ask that you don't look at, look at this story and say, I'm not that bad or look at this story and say, I'm more hopeless than that guy. You know, look at your own life and evaluate your own life and only you can answer that. The disease of alcoholism is the only self-diagnosed disease. Until you accept the fact that you're an alcoholic, until you admit the fact that you're an alcoholic, nothing can be done. And, and, um, and um, once you do that, there's hope. Once you do that simple thing, once you admit to yourself that I'm an alcoholic, there's hope for you. You know, there was hope for a hopeless drug addict like me. There's hope for you.